offered your grace to me when you came to Lodabar to get me. To no longer have to be bound up with what the world said I couldn't be free from. To sit at the king's table like one of the king's sons. What amazing grace. God, I am so moved by the songs and God, what you've given me as far as going forward. Because I remember, I was Mephibosheth. I was the cripple. That was me. And because of the blood covenant, I got free. I got to come out of Lodabar and sit at the king's table. Father, thank you for your kindness, your, your, your amazing grace, God. It's indescribable, it's unbelievable. God, I thank you so much for your amazing grace. Pray for Miss Helen Smith, God, that you would restore her. Her, her body levels and, and everything that's, that's skewed right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus, I pray that you will be healed of God even now that you bring those levels back to normal. And I speak that in the name of Jesus. I also pray for hope, all of that incision, God, that you will heal the incision. God, that all of the cancer will be completely removed, all of the tumors, all of the Everything that's not working properly, Father, we just bind it right now in the name of Jesus and we put it under the blood. And God, we ask for a miraculous healing, a speedy recovery. I pray for grace for Randy. I pray for grace for the kids. Uh, I, pray, I pray for the mores, God, as they're dealing with um, Miss Helen and all of that. God, I pray for Brother David and them as they're off and, and getting some R&R, Father, that you would just minister to them even in this time. God, even in the rest, we need you to minister to us. So, God, there's so many needs, and, and God, it's so evident that we're in need of your amazing grace. I pray for each and every mercy house God that's here today. Father, in the name of Jesus, that they would finish, they would be everything that you have them to be, God. They no longer have to be in Lodabar. They can sit at the king's table. If they would accept the king's offer, they can sit at the king's table. Father, I pray for the rest of the service that you have your hand on it. In Jesus' name, turn and greet your neighbors.
take a serious look. If you need uh, a bulletin in order of worship today, go ahead and raise your hand up. These guys are coming forward with, with orders of worship. If you want one, if you want an order of worship, if you want a bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand up high so that the guys that are coming down can see you. We do have some down front here. Just come on forward. We have our guys coming down to uh, bring the bulletins down. If you need a bulletin, if you need a, a worship guide, I was looking for that word. If you need a worship guide, just put your hand up high, okay? We welcome you all uh, today here. We thank you for being here. Um, Miss Leanne, all those guys are passing those out. Miss Leanne needs to make Jesus' name, as we take up this offering, God, I pray that you would honor it, you would bless it. In the garden, you told them not to eat the one tree. It's about obedience, and it's because it belongs to you. The same with our tithe. When we withhold our tithe, we're eating of the tree because it belongs to you. It's not ours to hold on to. So God, I pray that tithing principles would, would be ingrained in us because we go into partnership with God and He blesses the 90%. So God, I pray that you would bless this offering, bless those who are giving it, and God, as it goes around the world and across the country and into the local church, Father, I pray that your hand would be in it. Jesus' name.
Samuel chapter 9, verse 21. Now David said, verse number 1, 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you're in Ephesians, Philippians, you're not close. Come to the altar. It's kind of what's with the second sentence. It's not like Genesis or something. That's easy to find. Now David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am at your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? In verse 1, he just said, Kindness. And he said, In, in, this next, in verse 3, there's a difference between your kindness and God's kindness, okay? That I may show the kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, but he's laying at his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. It's Lodabar. Lodabar. <laughs> now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself, face down, in reverence and in honor. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and says, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your, and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. 
But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. That's a good word right there. According to all that God commands, will you do? As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Michael. All who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants in Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was laying in both his feet. The, the subject this morning, if you have not gathered already, is amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for showing kindness. Thank you for coming to Lord of our giving. Thank you for your amazing grace. God, I pray that your hand will be on the rest of this morning. Jesus. Amen. John Newton was born on July 24th, 1725 in London, England. His mother died when he was young, and his father commanded the Mediterranean merchant marine, marine vessel. And as a boy, John Newton sailed the Mediterranean Sea with his father. By his late teens, Newton joined the crew of the HMS Harwich, a British man of war, but soon deserted the ship. Upon apprehending the truant team, the ship's officers disciplined him harshly and demoted him to the bottom of the ranks. Beaten but unchanged, that's a good word, beaten but unchanged, the lad pursued a life at sea. Soon Newton boarded an African slave trading ship headed for Sierra Leone. The slave trader mistreated him so harshly, he became tough and callous towards others. Soon Newton skippered his own slaving ship, known for his cursing and coarse talk. Newton was labeled the great blasphemer. While transporting his human cargo, Newton's ship encountered a violent sea storm. The ship was tossed about in monstrous dark waves. Frightened for his life, Newton recalled scriptures his mother had taught him in his early childhood. Newton called out to God for his life, although he was nearly certain he was too wicked to be saved. Surviving the storm, Newton then began to read the Bible. A new picture of a loving, forgiving Lord began to form in his heart. Soon he realized that even a harsh-hearted slave trader could be redeemed by the grace of God. Newton's life changed almost overnight. He left the slave trade, opened a new business, and was befriended by many strong Christian men. William Cowper, John Wesley, George uh, Whitefield, William Wilberforce, who would later contend with the English Parliament to abolish slavery. John Newton was the author of Amazing Grace. No matter how far you go down the road, God's amazing grace is still adequate, appropriate, and available. Adequate, adequate, appropriate, and available to those who will accept the offer of amazing grace. John Newton was, he started off as a sailor, a slave trader and a sinner. And he becomes a surveyor, a songwriter, and a saint. Amazing grace found John Newton and he was changed forever. He was changed forever. Amazing grace found him. Part of the truth of what I want to deal with today is the fact that amazing grace finds us. Amazing grace looks for us. We aren't just so uh, eligible that we just, uh, you know, God selects us for his amazing grace because we qualify on some list of, of you know, some checklist. 
No, we're qualified because we're human beings. And God said that he's not willing that any perish, that all come to repentance. So, so what is grace? Who gives grace? How is grace defined? In, in, secular, uh, in, in secular terms, uh, grace is synonymous with elegance, poise, finesse, smooth operation. Biblical synonyms include unmerited favor, mercy, steadfast love, and in particular, in this text, kindness is a synonym, a word that's used interchangeably with grace. Now, kindness is 240 times in the Old Testament, this word, chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D is the English transliteration. And it is more than just being nice to somebody. The word kindness that's used here is, is literally amazing grace. That is the literal English transliteration. And it has the idea of strength, faithfulness, and love. And, and the author, the, uh, excuse me, the translators of, of that word chesed didn't include just one word. Because no one word was adequate to describe the volume, the depth, the immensity of the word chesed that's used when David reached out in kindness to Mephibosheth. It's strength with love. It's faithfulness uh, with strength and love. It's love with faithfulness and strength. If they're all intermingled, then you really can't have the one without the other. Because it's the fullness of, of the word kindness that we get the word amazing grace, or the words amazing grace. Literally, if we were to define it in one uh, statement, we would say kindness in this regard is amazing grace. And so I thought about the, you know, you think about when, if, if you're preaching or teaching, you think about the different titles, because titles bring everything together. Um, obviously, amazing grace was most fitting, but I thought about uh, blood, brokenness, and beauty. I thought about going that direction because those are the three uh, angles that I want to deal with. Today. I want to deal with the blood covenant between Jonathan and David. I want to deal with the broken cripple, which is Mr. M. I like that. It's way easier to say. Mr. M. Mephibosheth. And then the beautiful charity. Charity is another word for love. Love is another word that describes grace. Okay? You know, in the fruits of the Spirit, I always wondered why grace was not in the list in Galatians 5, 22, there's nine fruits of the Spirit. I always wondered why grace was not part of that list. It's because grace is interweaved in the whole list. That list is our best explanation for God's amazing grace. The best that, that we can come up with Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kind of gentleness, self-control, all of that. All of those describe God's amazing grace. And so in this blood covenant, if you're, if you're taking notes, you say number one would be the blood covenant. This is kindness lived out. David honored his covenant with Jonathan by showing Mephibosheth the cripple charity or God's grace. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, it describes this, this covenant uh, with, with John, between Jonathan and David. It says the soul of Jonathan was knit, literally intertwined, as in a rope that's, that's been, uh, you know, French braided or tied in a complicated knot. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David. And his armor, and his sword, his bow, and his belt. This was the blood covenant. So what happened? Why is it a blood covenant? Back in, in those days, they would cut little notches in their arms, in their right arms, until it bled, just enough to Make it bleed, not enough to send it to the hospital, but just enough to make it bleed. The other person would do the same, and they would join their arms together. 
and the one blood would infuse into the other person and so on and so forth, vice versa. And there would be established a blood covenant. And whatever was decided in that infusion of blood was then to be set forth in this blood covenant. When Jonathan reached out to David in this covenant, does it, Jonathan, now let me, let me rewind just a second. Saul was king of Israel. First king of Israel, right? According to uh, scholarship, there technically is a second king of Israel. Somebody was telling me that. Alex Herbert was saying, hey, no, there's a second king of Israel. Look at the Bible. But anyways, the, uh, there's the northern kingdom and all of them. Saul was the king of Israel. Jonathan was, the, was Saul's son. Okay? So, David, however, was anointed as king. According to the world standards, Jonathan had every right to the throne. So why did he relent? Why did he, why did he, why did he relent to David? Why would you give up your throne, give up your position? Why would you give that up? You give that up on the basis that Jonathan recognized the anointing that was on David's life. He recognized this guy is who's up next. And I would be a fool to try to become king, even though by world standards, he had every right to be king. He had the natural right. He was next in line to be king. Jonathan was supposed to be king, quote unquote. But Jonathan made a covenant with David. He said, I recognize that you are God's anointed and you're supposed to be in this position. And so what did he do? He, he relented his position. He gave him his robe, the, the royal robe that Jonathan had. He gave that to David. He said, this is yours. You're the prince. You're the next one. You're it. He also took off his, his garments, his belt, his outer garments, and said, not only am I going to relent my position to you, but I'm going to relent my possessions to you. Because when we recognize the true anointing, I was going to wait to get to that part. Man, it's just so exciting to get to that. When we recognize, I'm going to just cut to the chase, God is anointed. Jesus Christ to be the king in our lives and we are Jonathan and what we need to do is we need to take off our road we give up our position as in control of our life we give up our possessions I'm not saying don't have a bass boat and don't do all that but if you would give them to God when he gives them back to you they'll be blessed if you don't give them to God they won't have his blessing on them and you don't want them anyways and so what happens is we enter into the blood covenant through Jesus Christ. He shed his blood on the cross. I put my arm up and I said, Jesus, I need you to infuse your blood into my life. I need you to take control. I'm going to give you position as king of my life. I'm going to give you my worldly possessions. I'm going to come up under your protection. Jonathan could have uh, uh, got a bunch of people together. He could have got people together. But he said, no, I realize the anointing that's on your life. And I want the protection because you have God on your side. And that's the thing is when we relent to Jesus Christ, he is God's anointed. He is God's king. He's the one that's chosen. And if we would relent our position, our possession, our protection, and even our power. Jonathan had his bow and his sword. He says, look, not only do I want to give you my position, my robe, my possessions, I want to submit to your protection, but I want to give you my power. In other words, all my skills, my abilities, that which I have to offer the kingdom, I give them to you, and you use them how you want. That's what happens in a blood covenant. As we relent to the anointing of God in our lives, we give him position. You are not on the throne of your life, and if you are, you're in a bad spot. You're in a bad spot. We give God the honor of our possessions, and when we relent them to, that, to Him, He gives them back to us, and they're blessed. And we say, God, I need your protection. But I realize the anointing of God. You can't protect yourself and your family nearly 
as good as God can. And part of the issue that we are having is that we try to protect our own family and our own strength and our own abilities and our own powers. You need to take them babies. I don't care if they're 35 or 135 or three days old. You need to take them to this altar and you lay them down and you say, God, I need you to take protection, possession. I need you to take my kids. I recognize the anointing that's on Jesus Christ and I need to relent that to you. My position, my possession, my protection, my power, everything I submit. I tuck under the blood of the anointing of Jesus Christ based on the blood that was shed on Calvary. We enter into a blood covenant. David honored Mephibosheth because of the blood covenant. He said, for the sake of Jonathan. And you know what? You may be Mephibosheth or not. We're all going to finish that in one sense. You know, God honors you if you're under the blood for the sake of Jesus. If it was dependent on your abilities, your strength, guess what? We'd all be in trouble. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that do it. Good. There's none that seek after God. But all have sinned. And fall short. So we have the blood coming. Go to the next one, Christopher, please. It's the broken triple. Now, Lodabar in Hebrew means no way, no pasture, or no communication. Think about a place that's dry that's deserted. Where there's no family involvement. There's not a lot of food. You have to struggle for every bit of food. You have to struggle just to make it a day. That's a little bar. If you look in 2 Samuel chapter 4, I'm not going to take the time to read it. 2 Samuel 4 verse 4 describes what happened in Mephibosheth. He was in the royal nursery. He heard about Saul and Jonathan. The nurse did. He was only five years old. Mephibosheth was. His nurse heard about Saul and Jonathan. And so he, the nurse said, I better get him out of here. And so... She ran, and as they were running in a hurry, their feet got tripped up, and Mephibosheth's legs got bent under the nurse. When you see the word lame in the Bible, it's typically talking about ankle deformities. Sometimes it's hips, sometimes it's knees, but the, the very, very common thing was that if someone was lame, they had some sort of ankle deformity. That hindered, if not disallowed, walking altogether. And so not only was he in Lodabar, but he was lame. He was laboring under a, a, a faulty pretense. He had no hope. Think about this. He was supposed to be the next king. How about in your life? What were you supposed to do? I was supposed to be a doctor. So I went to college for in the first place. I was supposed to be definitely at the very least a college baseball player. I wasn't very good at the other school. I was decent at baseball. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether the nurse tripped or he tripped or he chose. You end up in Lodabar all the same. What happens is we get churchy, we get religious, and we say, well, at least I'm not that. And then people who are that are coming into the church. And we exclude them from our tables. We exclude them. We exclude God's amazing grace that He showed you. You don't extend that to 
And that's the heart, that's the danger that we live in. But this broken cripple, he was in low bar. You gotta think, when he was real young, he may have some memories, a few memories. He was in the royal nursery with everything provided for him. No worries, no nothing. As a three, four, five-year-old, I'm sure he doesn't have a lot of had a lot of memories, but I, I bet you had some. I know there's a difference that he noticed between what he used to be and what he became in Lodabar as an adult. And you know, I bet you, it's, I, I put the last that he was left out. I bet you he thought that he was never going to get out of Lodabar. Think about it. Think about the bitterness that's created inside of our hearts when we live with regrets, when we live with failures. We say, I wish I would have done this. Think about that nurse that said, if I just would not have done this, this could have happened. Think about the regrets in, in, in Mephibosheth's life. Just think what could have happened had I not tripped, had that, not, had that one situation, that one moment in time, if I could just change one thing, what would it be? If you could just change one thing, you all are thinking of something right now that you would change. What would change in my children, in, with my wife, with my husband, with my family? What would I change? Would I change anything? And we find ourselves in spiritual or emotional low to bar based on regrets, based on failures, based on bitterness that arises in our life over what could have happened or what should have been. I'm going to tell you, if you don't make a choice to leave Lodabar, then you won't ever get out. Because amazing grace is coming to get you out of Lodabar. Go to the next one, the beautiful charity. So you got to think this guy has had no hope and no future. I don't know how many years, if I won't say it was 20, two and a half years or whatever, but he was grown. Several years later, 1 Samuel chapter 4, he gets injured. 2 Samuel chapter 9, he gets called. So at least five, in Bible days, that's got to be for his probably 25 or 30. You know how the Bible is fast forward. Well, I'm glad. get it there. So the third and last point, the beautiful chair. You have the blood covenant, which David is honoring John. Jesus uh, is, is our picture here, and God honors Jesus. He honors you for Jesus' sake. So David one day decides, hey, is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I can show amazing grace to? You know, Saul tried to kill him. Most people that try to, most people that offend us, we eat, shut them out, we hold them at arm's length, we become bitter, we become, we, we hold on forgiveness. That's not what grace does. Grace doesn't hold on to that stuff. You know, it says in love, which uh, in 1 Corinthians, it says love holds no record of wrongs. And it says God is love, so if we're active and involved in God, we all have a tendency to hold on, hold on to stuff. But I'm going to tell you, amazing grace doesn't operate like that. David said, hey, I want to know if there's anybody in the house of the person that caused offense. He went beyond just forgiving Saul. He wanted to bless his house, his contingents. He wanted to bless the out, outer parameters of his enemy. It's one thing to forgive somebody. It's another thing when you go out of your way to do something nice for the very person that's caused offense to you. That's amazing grace. It's easy to, to uh, you know, be in a relationship with everybody that pats you on the back and shakes your hand and smiles real nice for you. But what do you do when somebody comes at you? What do you do when somebody falls on you and ruins your life? What do you do when somebody comes and throws spears at you and throws arrows at you? Do you show amazing kindness? Because most of the time we don't. We get mad, we get bitter, and we walk out the door just the same as when we got here, not changed. 
by the amazing grace of God that's available to us. You know? We, we leave out, all right, we, just, we have church, great. Why do you even come? Go home and watch TV. It's going to be a lot easier than getting your kids up, getting ready, getting dressed, putting your makeup on, whatever. Unless you're going to make them on, that's good. <laughs> Why even come? If you didn't come to receive from God, then go home. I don't want you to go home. <laughs> but seriously, people come every week in and week out, and amazing grace is available every single day, every single week. Here, you got to come in these doors to get God's amazing grace. But we're so consumed because somebody caused us to be lame. We're so consumed because of our own lameness, our own uh, hang-ups, our own insecurities, our own battles, our own struggles. And David said, hey, I don't want to be offended because he knows that if he releases that unforgiveness, it frees him up. And if you release the unforgiveness, it doesn't matter about the other party. They may still be dumb. But guess what? You're released. You're free. When you hold unforgiveness, you're carrying your own self around in a box. You ain't carrying nobody else. They ain't bound. You are. We are bound. And that's what happened is with me in my own situation. Is when I released the unforgiveness towards certain individuals, guess what? I became free. And now whatever God does with them, whatever they choose to respond to God with, that's on them. David said, I want to show kindness. I want to show amazing grace. How about you? You show amazing grace to people? There's some other amazing things that I've shown some people. I've shown some other amazing stuff, but how about amazing grace? Because if your life is here with God in Christ, you're to show other people amazing grace. David said, I, I, I want to show kindness. Not only kindness, I want to show God's kindness. You're wasting your time if you show your own kindness. But if you ever allow the Holy Spirit to come in you and change your life and just totally infiltrate you and take over, you give Him your position, your possessions, you give Him your power, your skills, your abilities. It's amazing what God can do. Now, when David's, David's servant came to Lodabar, Mephibosheth could have said, I'm not going. You do not have to accept God's amazing grace. That's your choice. But guess what? It's available. It's available to you. you the only reason that your life don't change, guys, and everyone else, is because you don't accept the invitation from the king. That's it. Now, is everything going to be perfect? Well, I'm going to tell you, my imperfections are a whole lot easier to deal with today. He told him, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Why? Because faith is the opposite of fear. And when you come to the king's table, you don't have to have fear. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and the sound mind. He said, don't be afraid. He said, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you favor, no longer failure. He said, I'm going to give you forgiveness. How do I know that? He said that he was going to restore the land. The reason the land was broken was because of the conflict that was wedged in between Saul and David. And of course he was crippled. He said, I'm going to give you a feast and not a famine for the wilderness. He said, here's a big one, and this is something I thought was neat in here. He wanted to be a father and not a figure. What's the difference? He just didn't want to be king and rule. He wanted to be a father. He wanted to teach Mephibosheth. He wanted to offer Mephibosheth that which he didn't have because of his crippling. He wanted to be a friend and not a fault finder. If, if the Holy Spirit gives you something that you need to give to, to a friend, it says faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? So sometimes we need to restore that person. But a true friend doesn't uh, walk around and find fault. In fact, it says love does not find fault. 
And here, here was a, here's the last one. He wanted to give him feet and not fate. In Lodabar, he was carrying his fate because of his feet. David said, if you sit at my table, the feet are not relevant. How do I know that? Because it says that he was sitting at the table with the king's sons. Think about it. If he's sitting at a table, he's going to be wearing the king's garbs. He's going to have the king's silverware, the king's food. No one, no guest or onlooker that was not familiar with Mephibosheth's story would ever know that he once was lame. Why? Because he's dining at the king's table. Hopefully, one or two of you can relate to eating at the king's table. So I guess my, my heart, John Newton, Amazing Grace found John Newton and it changed his life forever. Amazing Grace found Mephibosheth, God honored the blood covenant he looked upon a broken cripple with beautiful charity. He had a beautiful charity to offer. And, and I believe that there's people here that are concentrating on their lame experiences. They're held by their past. They're held by unforgiveness. They're held by regret. What could I have done different? And I guess the, the invitation, go ahead and touch that. I guess the invitation this morning, and Robert's going to be down front. If you need, I'll pray with you all so they can continue on. Amazing Grace, have you accepted it? Have you ever accepted it? Maybe you haven't, maybe there's possessions that you need to give to God. If you give them to God, He wants you to have them. You'll give them back better than you ever had. Is there a position? Are you king of your own life as God? How about your skills and abilities? Are you withholding your skills from the kingdom of God? If you are, then you're the king of your life, not Jesus. How about amazing grace? Are you lame? Are you a low bar? A spiritual low bar? Left out? Empty? Alone? Broken? God's amazing grace is available. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name.